truly a class act and one of the great gentlemen of entertainment. Did you see his eyes when he picked up the guitar? I mean, he was 16 years old again, riding blue suede shoes. And as a matter of fact, he brought me a pair, and I wear him in his memory tonight. I'll tell you, you could <laughs> look at the soles on him. <laughs> that is four-wheel drive on two feet, huh? And you know. There are several places here in Los Angeles I could wear these shoes and get extremely fortunate later on. <laughs> anyway, Carl Perkins appeared at the House of Blues here in Los Angeles, I believe the night before last, and he got such a terrific review in the paper this morning. I just want to share it with you as a, as a testament to this man's talent. Quote, Perkins' survival is a testament to the value of solid craftsmanship and honest expression and one bolt of inspiration, his blue suede shoes, is one of the sacred texts of rock and roll. That anthem climaxed a show by Perkins that was memorable, not only for its revisiting of rock and roll's roots, but also for the dignity and poise of a modest man who is supremely comfortable with himself. Bravo. I think that is right on the mark, and I thank him uh, last night for one of the most pleasant evenings we have had here in some time. It was such a joy to see the clock not stop at 1.15 a.m. <laughs> You know what I thought we'd do tonight? You know, we tried these things last night, these, uh, these questions to which there are no answers. Here are some, and these are actual test answers that students have given during science exams uh, in elementary and high school here in the United States. Uh, H2O is hot water and CO2 is cold water. To collect fumes of sulfur, hold a deacon over a flame in a test tube. <laughs> when you smell an odorless gas, it is probably carbon monoxide. Water is composed of two gins, oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is pure gin. <laughs> hydrogen is gin and water. <laughs> the moon is a planet just like the Earth, only it's much deader. Dew is formed on leaves when the sun shines down on them and makes them sweat. A supersaturated solution is one that holds more than it can hold. And, and here's one that caught my eye. Mushrooms always grow in damp places, and therefore, they appear to be umbrellas. <laughs> Germinate to become a naturalized German. <laughs> Momentum. What you give a person when they are going away. And, <laughs> and for dog bite, uh, put the dog away for several days. If it is not recovered, then kill it. <laughs> my, my thanks to Ray for those in Grand Island, Nebraska. Well said and well done. Bruno Kirby is here tonight, the editor of uh, Time Magazine through its glory years. Henry Grunewald is here. And, of course, you on the toll-free. Saddle back, fire up the color teenies, and uh, don't you step on my blue suede shoes. We'll be right back. My friend, the actor Bruno Kirby, will be starring with Al Pacino and Johnny Depp in the film Donnie Briscoe, which opens on the 28th of February. He'll also appear in a play in uh, New York called Bunny Bunny this March. It's always great to have Bruno Kirby That's here. It's always and great I, to be here. Thank you for coming on. The last time you were here, you told a story when you were the movie usher here in Hollywood. Yeah. I guess at a theater up near the legendary Musso and Frank Yeah, restaurant. right next door to, at, at the Vogue. Yeah, the Vogue and, and you, you talked about, I, I think you met Elvis. Did you ever meet anybody else at that I, movie well, theater? One night I came in. And there was, a, there was a girl who worked there, uh, and her name was Fatima. And I never knew what nationality she was, yeah. but she was a very heavy set girl. Mm -hmm. Minimum 250 pounds. Okay. Very heavy. Mm -hmm. Miss No Meals. Uh, no Meals, and I always felt kind of sorry for her because it, I'm the type of person, when I look at somebody, I always imagine a sad, a very sad life for them if, if I get any inkling of it. Yeah, like they would go home to their apartments yes, and stay a, there a and never go existence. out. Yeah, yeah. And I would uh, come to work, and I would say to her, uh, so on, on Monday, I'd say, so Fatima, did you have a nice weekend? And she'd say, you know, uh, parties, dancing, drinking, usual thing. <laughs> and I'd say, parties, dancing, usual thing. And I think to myself, why is she lying to me? Yeah, yeah. She obviously has no life. It's a sad existence. Years later, I found out that I was the one who didn't have a life. <laughs> and she really was having parties, parties dancing, dancing, and, and drinking. Yeah. And, and for some reason, she always, it would always bother her that I wanted to be an actor. I came to work one night, and she said, Mr. Actor, guess who's inside? And I'm putting on my bow tie. I say, who? Mr. Groucho Marx. I said, Groucho Marx is inside that theater? She said, yes, he is. So, wow, Groucho Marx. Yeah. Legend. A legend. Boyhood hero. Nobody better than yeah. Groucho Marx. With that, he comes walking out, and he looks at me and he says, 
You, you wouldn't happen to have a toothpick, would you? Is it a toothpick, Mr. Marks? Wait right here. Don't move. Stay right there. And I run out of the Vogue Theater. I make a hard left. I go down Hollywood Boulevard, run into Musso Frank's. Oh, the restaurant, sure. Right? And I literally say to the lady behind, as I'm reaching for the toothpicks, these are for Groucho Marx. And I run <laughs> back in like a maniac. And he's standing there. And I say, here they are, Mr. Marx. Here are the toothpicks. He says, fine, fine. And he starts to walk away. Now, when you meet someone like that, and I can remember as a kid with my dad, you know, Bruce Kirby, he'd wake me up 4 o'clock in the morning, we would sit and watch these Marx Brothers movies together. On television, sure. And you don't get a chance often enough to say, Thank you. So he's walking towards the door, and I'm swaying it out because I don't know if I can do it, but I, I, I do it anyway, and I, I say, excuse me, Mr. Marks? M Mr. Marks? And he's got the, the door halfway open. He says, uh, what is it? He's got a toothpick in his mouth. I said, well, uh, I just want to thank you for all the laughter you've given me. And he looks at me for a second. He takes out the toothpick as if it's, as if it's a, a cigar, and he goes, and I just want to thank you for all the relief you've given me. <laughs> and, he and that's as good as it gets. Yeah, you yeah. know, I worked at that theater for a couple of years, and Elvis and Groucho, and, and that was it. I should have paid them. Did you ever see Groucho again anywhere? I went to see him do one of his in concert shows. Oh, surely, surely. Uh, later on in life, uh, when he was a much older gentleman. But still funny and still wonderful. Oh, no, he was wonderful. I knew his son, Albert Marks, who, did. who wrote about him. And one day, Al called the house and he said, would you like to have dinner with, or have lunch with Dad at oh, Hillcrest? Man. And I went down and had lunch with Groucho Marx. And like you say, I mean, you, you, you don't want to open your mouth for fear of saying something stupid in front yeah. of this man. He was just terrific. At just, a different level. Yeah. You grew up on the west sides of, uh, of Manhattan, yeah. on, on the streets of Manhattan. What was your game there? Like everybody in, in New York on the yeah. streets had a game that they were really good at. Some were stickball, some was yeah. baseball. What were you good I at? I was the only game, you know, I remember once I uh, was going to do a movie of the week. It was, gonna be, it was Rob Reiner and, and myself and, and, and Christopher Guest. We played these guys on a softball team uh -huh. who wouldn't grow up. Just kept playing softball, softball. So I got out there. Rob said, you're going to play the shortstop. And I started working out at shortstop. I'm serious, four hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I started to get that crazy notion that with a little, if I'd just gotten a little proper coaching. I know, I'm good. I'm real I'm good. I'm really good. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now, we come to the first day of shooting, and they bring in the guys who are going to be on the other teams. And these were guys who were in the minor leagues for a day. And these guys start doing stuff. And these are the guys who couldn't cut it. Yeah. Stuff I couldn't even dream of doing. Right. But in my life, I do have one game, and it's a game called Off the Point. The side of a building, yeah. it comes out, and I have this friend, Peter Godowski, and we had one day in New York City where we played, you start in the morning, and if you can hold the court, you get, if you keep winning, you stay. As I recall the game, you throw the ball. Off, you get the bottom of the side of the Off building. the bottom of the side Single, of the Single, double, off the wall. Right. The triple home run. But the great thing about the game is, because there is traffic in cars that are stopped for lights, because you play it on a corner, until the ball hits the ground, it's in play. That's right. So you've got balls bouncing off of cars, hitting a fire escape, coming down, and you can still catch this. And one day, Peter Kodowski and I, we, we kept the court the whole day. And that's like the only game I could have ever turned pro. Now, this kid, Godowski, that you mentioned. Uh, you, this guy you, now, this guy. Okay, but now you worked with this guy at the deli. You, you had a job at the deli. And, and he, I had a job at and, the and deli. And he was the weekend guy, as he, I read. Yeah, well, yeah, he was the weekend guy. And you were pissed. And I was, well, here's why I was pissed, because I'd work Monday through Friday breaking, you know, back-breaking kind of work as a delivery boy with Canada Dry cases and all of this stuff. And he would come in for like a Saturday and get all the all more the tips, tips than yeah. I ever got. Now, Pat and Lou, who ran this delicatessen, these two, these two guys in New York City, I get one day, one day I finally speak up for myself. And I say, I, I don't like this. It's not fair. And Pat says to me, come with me. And he takes me over by a, a calendar and he says, Christmas Eve. I said, what about Christmas Eve? What date? I said, it's, it's, a, it's a Wednesday the 24th. You're going to be rich. That's when all the tips are going to come. You'll get more in that one day than Godowski gets in 52 weekends. More than he ever dreamed. Yeah, exactly. Well, naturally, I show up uh, Christmas Eve morning, putting on my apron, and Godowski comes walking. Oh. <laughs> so, what, what are you doing here? Yeah, yeah. What are you doing here? I love you, but what are you doing here? He said, they said you need help. <laughs> I said, well, this, this stinks, Pete. Well, he goes, we spend all day, right? And I'm bitter. I'm very bitter about it. And after we close, it's Christmas Eve, the guys break out a bottle of this drink, Drambuli. I don't oh, drink. I'm a kid. Oh. I'm a kid. I'm 13 years old. I don't drink. And it's like Italian lighter fluid. Oh, it's lightning in a bottle. Yeah. Exactly. 
and they start pouring the drinks. Now, of course, I'm bitter. I, I start pouring myself more drinks and more drinks. <laughs> then they say, well, here's your bonuses. I figure, well, they'll do right by me now. Yes, sir. They give me five bucks. They give him like a 20. I leave the place. I'm Live walking it. around Live New York. It. Now 13 years old, but I'm drunk. And, I'm ste and steamed. Exactly. I end up, I go into the Whalens, which was across from Radio City Music Hall. I get in the phone booth. I try and call Kadowski to kind of tell him off and tell him how unfair I think life is in general. He's not home, but I'm drunk. They threw me out. I started banging on this phone. They came and got me, and they threw you me out. You so-and-so? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> they threw me out into the streets. <laughs> We're with Bruno Kirby, who will be seen next month in uh, uh, Bonnie, uh, Donnie, Donnie, Donnie Brasco. Donnie Brasco, and uh, later uh, in New York in Bunny Bunny. Couldn't you do some that had mm. easier names? Yeah. Exactly. I'll try <laughs> we'll next time. Be back with Bruno and Bonnie and Bunny uh, at 800-952-2788 <laughs> right after these messages. Get on. <laughs> with the actor Bruno Kirby, here is Jennifer on the toll-free in Walpole, Massachusetts. Hello. Hi. Hello, Jennifer. Hey, Tom. It was, it's nice to timely talk to you. Well, thank you. It's nice to be spoken to. Oh, good. Um, Mr. Kirby, I was just wondering if you had any funny stories from the set of City Slickers. Well, the first thing you should know about City Slickers is uh, I am deathly allergic to everything you see on that screen. Uh, b before, before I started the picture, I had to go to a, an allergy doctor because, you know, the people making the picture were my friends and, and say, uh -huh. do you think I can do this? And he said, well, with lots of shots. But, but here's, the, here's my, my city slickers, uh, my take on the whole experience. But when you say allergic, are you allergic to horses? Horses, the cattle, the dust, <laughs> the pollen. Oh my God. No, there isn't anything that I'm not... I mean, I am the, in the top... I'd say in the top 1% of people with allergies in the United yeah. States, which I wish were my college scores, but they aren't. But anyway, but the most important thing about a, a picture uh, about city slickers is the thing you have to get is a good horse. And that's, what you, that's the most important thing, because what happens is, is, is that's who you're going to be really acting with. People think it's Billy Crystal, it's Daniel Stern, it's really the horse. Because if, if in your script it says you talk to Billy about how much you miss your father, and in the horse's script it says this is where he bites Billy's horse on the neck, <laughs> that's, the moment, that's the moment you're going to really learn what fear is. So we show up, and I keep trying to find a good horse. And as, as most actors, we have this idea of what I'd like. I mean, I'd like a Palomino. I'd like this. I'd like that. And the wranglers on these movies, they kind of think of, of actors as pansies, and they just want to give them a horse and shut them up. And I'm going through horse after horse, and I can't get one. Finally, they bring me a Palomino, and I say, well, let's give this a try. And I take off on this horse, and as I'm riding, I start to gallop. The horse does this with his head. And he starts to go sideways, and he starts like he's going to turn over. And I say, whoa, 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 whoa. And I say to these wranglers, listen, this horse throws his head. It's, it's very dangerous. Said, Don't worry. You show up in Colorado some in two weeks. We'll have that baby working just right for you. Two weeks later, I show up in Colorado. I'm on this racetrack as fast as I can go. And this horse does this thing again and goes sideways. And I throw, you know, what for me is a fit, which is the Italian fit, which is where I get very quiet. <laughs> I just drive, I ride over to the Wranglers, I get off the horse and I hand him the reins. He says, where are you going? You got 45 minutes, son. I said, no, no, I don't have 45 minutes because I'm done riding today. I said, I'm going to give you $5,000. What are you going to give us $5,000 for, son? Because you're going to go into this town and you're going to buy me a horse. And then at the end of the picture, I'll sell the horse back to the people. Because this horse throws his head and it will calm down, calm down, please. Listen, we just traded these, these Indians for a horse from an Indian reservation. Take a look at him. I said, okay, show me the horse. And they bring out this horse that has fallen through a cattle guard. He looks like Jake LaMotta in the, in the late stages. <laughs> of Raging Bull. Of Raging Bull, yeah. right? And I say, you've got to be kidding. I'm in a movie all my life. I've waited to write it. So to make a long story short. Long story short, this horse couldn't have been better. Oh, really? He's now... In all these westerns, he, he does take an improv well, the horse class. Is working no, he's got a big career. Oh, he's a career much better than mine. <laughs> but his name was Ute, and that's my City Slickers uh, experience. And thank you for asking, and I'm sorry I, I almost spoke for two hours about it. <laughs> okay. Now, you weren't offended that I said to make a long No, story. no, oh. I, you helped me. I, was, I have asthma. I can't keep going, you know. Oh.
<laughs> really? Good breathing thing. Could have fooled me. Anyway, Jennifer, <laughs> thanks for watching and thanks for calling tonight. All right. Thank you, Tom. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. You know, Bruno, the last time we were here, we talked about you at Catholic school and the brothers, but we yeah. never talked about nuns. Did you have sisters in school? I, I did. I had Franciscan nuns. I had sisters of charity. And, uh, you know, everybody, we talked about this last time, sister, and, 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 and you seem to be pretty comfortable with it. I don't know how comfortable I was with the experience. I can remember I would be in the lunchroom, and they would come down with a rubber hose and hit the... And whack you, oh, yeah. And whack, yeah, whack, or the table. And the soup would, like, go up in the air. But like you said last time, people did learn. I'll admit people learned. I don't know if they learned out of fear, but... There was one that uh, she did not teach at our school, but she was legendary in the Diocese of Milwaukee, Sister Judine. And she was legendary for being tough. And one day she was over at St. Agnes and she was teaching in one of the grades, six or seven, just for a day or two. And I was always loud. You know, I was always making commotion, making a noise or something. And she came over, she gets you by the ear like this and yanks you, man. And boy, I'll tell you, when somebody, when, yeah. you know, you move real, real fast. Yeah, of yeah. course. And you learn to shut up. Yes, very quick. And what was the difference to you between high school and grade school in, in terms of who, like, you see, I had the sisters in grade school. Then I had the yeah. Jesuits in, in high school, the fathers and the brothers, and they were great. Well, the, the, the difference with me was when I was in, when I was in, in, was in the grammar school in New York City, that was like a small little community when it was in the neighborhood. But then when I went up to Power, where Lou Alcindor at the time yeah, was Yeah, Power like, High School, sure. I walked through those doors, and I was totally uh, flabbergasted because it was like nobody really knew you anymore. I mean, in the neighborhood, I, I lived right next to the convent as a kid. Yeah. That's where the apartment was, so I knew all the nuns. When I got up there, it was like, you know, you didn't really count. You just, uh, you know. And, like, did, did they always remind you when you were learning Catholicism of what was the greatest sin of all? You know the one I mean? The greatest sin of all? Yeah, the old self-abuse. Yes, that's always the greatest sin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's always considered to be the greatest. Remember the lectures the on that? Sin. Yeah, they would spend yeah. hours telling us how awful that was. We would have detention. I don't. Did you have detention? We had jug. You stayed after school. You detention. just stayed after sure. school. We yeah. memorized things. Yeah. And we had a. We had a. I got. I actually got a, a detention once for tap dancing in the bathroom. Something which most people. What, was there a reason you were dancing in there? I was. I was with Peter Kadowski again, <laughs> and I was. I was. I was combing this my hair. This guy Kadowski kind of rolls through oh, your life. He was one he? of my best friends, <laughs> yeah. and I'm combing my hair, and we talk about style. And he says, you don't have any style. I said, oh, yeah, I have style. I have style like Fred Astaire. And I started doing this phony dance. Uh -huh. And Brother McLaughlin said, we, we, we like your dance very much, Mr. Quidicolo. We'd like to see it this afternoon in the tension. <laughs> so, <laughs> Did he ever catch you in anything else, the brother? Uh, he didn't catch me doing the one thing. When I knew I was going to graduate, I went to Central Park, and I caught a fish and put it, like, in his bathroom. And people went berserk. Like, who did this? Uh -huh. when, when, no, nobody spoke. Nobody talked. But that was the one thing you didn't catch me at. Yeah, okay. We're with Bruno <laughs> Kirby. We'll talk about, uh, about Bonnie Brasco and Bunny Bunny and you on the toll free at 800-952-2788 right after these announcements. With Bruno Kirby, here is John in the Bronx, New York. Hi, John. Welcome to CBS. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing fine, thanks. How are you, John? Okay. Good. My question for Bruno is, uh, how did you get the role in the movie The Godfather Part II? Ah, well, I, I got that role. It was a kind of an open call. Francis Ford Coppola saw every Italian in the world. And I went with my dad, who's this wonderful actor, Bruce Kirby, to this big kind of cattle call. And we go in together. And uh, my dad is from what I call the Yes School of Acting, which means if somebody says, can you ride a horse? Yes. Can you water ski? Yes. <laughs> Now, the plan is, after you do that, is you run out and you take, you know, horseback riding lessons, skiing lessons, whatever. So we go in together, and I'd done a couple of good films at that point. And uh, Francis says to my father, they start speaking Italian, and Francis says to my father, D does, uh, does Bruno speak Italian? And my father immediately says yes. He says, well, speak to him in Italian. And my father in Italian back says to him, I can't, because my son, he speaks street Italian. A word here, a word there. And... Uh, so, so I don't want to, you know, put him on the spot now. So, and I being out of my mind, I don't even know why I said this, but I said to Francis, you know, uh, Francis, what kind of a party are you interested in me for? Because, I, you know, I don't want to do, like, just one line or say, you know, the pizza is here or something. I, <laughs> you know, I've done a couple of good films. And, and he said, and he looked at me and said, kid, you just let me worry about the parts. I mean, I think to myself, well, that's the end of this. So a couple of a weeks go by, then a month goes by, and... I, 
I go to, to my girlfriend's house at the time, and I, and I knock on the door, and she opens it, it up, and her and her mother are jumping up and down, screaming out different things. And I thought, at first I thought somebody had been, been, been killed. And I hear young Clemenza, I hear Godfather too, and I hear all these incredible things. And I think what happened was I had done a TV series with Richard Castellano who played Clemenza. I had played his son. So I think Francis asked around and realized that I'd studied the man, and, and that's and, how I and, got the And part. knew the man, knew, knew who the man and was. And knew who the man was. What was the aftermath of The Godfather in terms of your own personal life? Uh, well, the, the greatest thing is if you're an Italian uh, and you're in The Godfather, you're set for life in any Italian neighborhood in the you, United you, States. You can't, you can't pay in any... You, can, you can't go wrong. You really can't. I was in Philadelphia doing Bunny Bunny. As I went from Italian deli to Italian deli, yeah. I was given food. <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, you, you just can't pay. I don't, think, I don't think Marlon has picked up a check since 1972. And I've watched him insist. But it's like the Godfather does not pay. Does not pay. They do not want to hear about it. Yeah. And it's... Uh, it's a gift. John, I'm glad you called. Thanks for Thank watching you. tonight. Okay, Tom. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Uh, Bunny Bunny. This is the story of Gilda Radner and the writer's wife, Bell. Yes, Alan's wife, Bell. Bell. And it is a, it's a wonderful play. We did it in Philly. Uh, it is a love story where two people don't ever make love. They just love each other their entire lives. They're as close of friends as, as they can be. They were something, by the way, those yeah, two. Yeah, they were great together. Yeah. And... Uh, it is a lovely, lovely play. And you see their whole relationship from beginning to end. She was something, I told you. I knew yeah. her in New York. We both worked in the same building. And I'll tell you, a ray of sunshine every day. Every day you'd see Gilda Radner, was the, the sun shone that That's day. what she I hear from a lot of people. Absolutely a terrific gal. Now, Bonnie Brasco, petty, Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Brasco. Bonnie Brasco, petty New York mafia criminals. Yeah, this is the low end. Uh -huh. This is, you know, you know, because of The Godfather, I'm always offered gangster things. And I never wanted to do one, do one because I figured, hey, that's as good as it gets. But this is the low end. These are the guys who break open the parking meters. What is our obsession with the, with the, with the mob? You know, uh, the, uh, the Godfather pictures and uh, Goodfellas and Casino. Why are, why are uh, Bugsy, why are we uh, so interested in this activity? I think the attraction is you've got people who, in the movies anyway, can live outside of the law and do what they want. Yeah. And I think there's a part in all of us, not that we like to be gangsters, but there is a part that says, in all of us that says, gee, I'd like to have one day where I could just do, really do whatever, whatever I, want. I want. and break all the rules, there are no <laughs> exactly. rules, and get away with it. And maybe that's the fascination. I don't it, know. Do you think the mafia or organized crime has any, does it have real power today as uh, compared with the 1950s, 1940s? Probably not as much as it used to. But now, you know, it's very funny. I see, and I don't, I don't mean this to endorse crime because I'm not, but, you know, you, see a lot, you hear a lot of people today talking about how great it is that the mafia has been broken up. Yeah. You know, oh, the mafia, the mafia. I always like to go up to those people and say, excuse me, I'd like to introduce you to the Colombians. They're going to come into this restaurant now, and they're going to take out everybody. everybody. The children, people in the building upstairs, everybody. everybody. And all of a sudden somebody says, wait, maybe, maybe these mafia guys... Maybe at least they were organized. They, they were very selective, weren't they? Yes. They, they picked the one guy yes. they wanted, and they got him real good. That's who they yeah. got. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, you look at the Russian mafia, the Colombian mafia. These guys are I've worse. heard they're very, very tough. They're the worst. And uh, people don't know it yet about the Russian mafia. Anyway, I thank the world of you, as you know. I hope you have a big thank success you. with, uh, with uh, Bunny Bunny in thank New York when it opens there. And I hope that, uh, and let me get this right now, Donnie Brasco yeah. does very, very well when it opens on thank February 28th. Bruno, it is always a Good pleasure. To see You're you, a great Ed. storyteller, okay? Take care. Next time, we'll do some other stuff. Yes, okay. we will. <laughs> uh, Henry uh, Grunewald from Time Magazine and the people he has met along the way uh, in journalism after these messages. Thanks again, Bruno.